Like, anyways, it's time to learn Torah. And uh, Dr. Yeah, Shapiro yeah. is here, class 50, 51, 50, 50. class 50. 50. We're up to the appendix, appendix. and we'll see yeah. a, a couple of weeks. Maybe and we'll week on the appendix and one week on the letters that weren't included. And if we have less, we have about uh, 25 less than normal. Maybe some more will come on. I don't know if it's because the hockey or barbecues, you know, especially <laughs> down the West Coast. It's, uh, it's a big barbecue day. Uh, as always, uh, just quickly, I you see on my desk, I have a whole pile here, so I'll just go through the things I have uh, uh, for 15 minutes or so before starting. Hashgacha Pratis, or Divine Providence. Right when I finished the class last week, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, because a number of you might be on uh, Menachem Butler's uh, distribution list, but lo and behold, uh, what do I get from him? He sends me this. Two things that uh, were discovered, and he and he has a link to his Twitter, Pinny Donner, Rabbi Pinny Donner of Los Angeles, who discovers all sorts of interesting things. He's the one that uh, I mentioned the the talk he gave on the Avana Rebbe, which was so interesting. Uh, lo and behold, he found uh, two letters uh, from uh, two two pictures of Rabbi Leopold de Cusio Greenwald, and here's one. Uh, uh, there's Rabbi Greenwald, uh, his wife. In the middle, there is his son, Jack, who I spoke to a couple of times on the phone. They're the ones, they burnt the rabbi's letters, but at the end of his life, he realized what a mistake it was, and he, he has a collection of like 50 letters that they put online, but nothing significant. Uh, and he just passed away in March. And then the, and here's another um, picture. This picture actually appears in one of Rabbi Greenwald's books. Uh, posthumously, they put it in, but it, it's much clearer here. You see him at his typewriter. So it was just ironic that the very day we were discussing about him, and uh, I, I told you the whole story about how his books went to Hebrew Union College. Lo and behold, uh, these things, um, these things surface. Um, if any of you are from Columbus, Ohio, uh, as I, you know, it's good to know. Um, uh, who Rabbi Greenwald was. Uh, uh, Nachum Shmaryahu sent me another thing. I could send it to anyone about this Shvan's Roy de Baruch, uh, about the Rebbe's kever. They have, the, the Rebbe gave instructions that they have, that there's a machitza um, of uh, however many tfachim they need it. So um, had there not been a machitza, the Kohenim would have to stand four almost back. There, there's no ceiling. The whole thing is set up that Kohenim can go there, but in a halachic way, that they can go there, but they do not accept, Chabad does not accept, at least mainstream Chabad, the concept that uh, the Rebbe's are, uh, don't give off Tuma. I, I mentioned last class, Rabbi Jacobovitz, he said that, um, you know, the Lithuanian Rosh Hashiva, they don't know history. If they knew history, then they would know that we Hungarians with our separatism, we're correct. And uh, that reminded me of something which is relevant to things we spoke about in the class. Uh, and that's this. Um, we've, where is it? We, we spoke a number of times about the idea, the, the uh, Torah and Derech Eretz, the Avna school system in Lithuania, which had there not been a Holocaust, it would have developed like a German Orthodox, you know, the, the laity. They weren't as, um, you know, you can't compare Lithuania to uh, Germany because in Germany, the Orthodox Jews were acculturated in German culture. They spoke German, they felt like they were German. No one in Lithuania felt that they were Lithuanian. They didn't speak Lithuanian, but they still had a certain modernity and they were moving in that direction. And um, Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, not uh, the singing rabbi, but his cousin, Zeli Shlomo Karlbach's father, by the way, uh, formerly from um, uh, Chaim Berlin. Why he's not a Chaim Berlin, now that's all another whole controversy. Uh, Din Torah, etc. I spoke about it in the past as well. But he published a book a few years ago on more than a few years ago, it was probably 10 years ago on um, his father. And it deals with um, this whole Yavna system in Lithuania. Now, this is, will be a shock for people. They think of Litvisha Judaism, they think of like Lakewood. They don't realize, like I've said many times, that the Neri Sorrell School is much more in line with um, the Lithuanian ethos. And uh, Ravara and Cutler, already in Lithuania, was regarded as, an, as a kanai, a, a, a zealot. And that wasn't traditional Lithuanian uh, Jewry. Um, what they have here, though, it's quite interesting. So Rabbi uh, Yosef Gavriel Beckhofer has a, um, a review of this book. And what do they say in here? 
This review has been reviewed by Gedoli Torah and Rashi Yeshivos who confirmed the picture drawn by Rabbi Karabach in his new work and who encouraged us to put his new historical insights before our readership. This is like a, it's almost comical because I'm telling you the Gedoli Torah and the Rashi Yeshivos, they don't know about this either. They have no clue. Well, what do they know? They're 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 post scheme and they're telling me they're coming. Rabbi Karlbach is the one who has the 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 the, um, the archives of and the uh, he's going into all the um, the newspapers and he's writing from the standpoint of German Orthodoxy. So he's the expert. He writes about the uh, the the Torah and Derech Eretz system that was being developed in Lithuania. You're going to ask some Rosh Hashiva in America uh, or a, a Gadol. What do they know about this? Uh, but what this means really is it, it doesn't mean they confirm the picture drawn by Rabbi Karlbach. Well, who are they to confirm it? He has the, the, the information. What do they have? What it means in Jewish observer lingo is that uh, this don't protest and say, why are we talking about this Torah and Derech Eretz in Lithuania? This is against the yeshiva world, etc. We shouldn't know about this. It should be covered up, whatever. What they're saying is that the Gedolim said that it's okay for the masses to know that Lithuania was not only uh, yeshivas, that there was more to it than that there was a, uh, a whole system of laity who were... Uh, you know, being educated in a separate way. And I guess for the Jewish observer, that maybe is considered a, a chidush, a big deal that they would actually put this in. But it doesn't really mean they confirm the picture. I mean, what does is, what is Karl Bach need them to confirm the picture? He's the expert on it, not them. But what it means really is that they gave the haskama, because if you were to know what the Jewish observer was, anything that even slightly controversial would have needed uh, rabbinic approval uh, uh, to, to get in. What else did I want to share with you? Um, a, few other, a number of other things. What do I have here? Um, ah, very nice. Uh, two things here. Um, first, uh, three uh, three things. First of all, um, Rabbi Leib said, I should stress, so I stress it here, Rabbi Leib. I mentioned the Bouge of Rebbe, and then he wrote an approbation to this book. The Bouge of Rebbe, as he points out, and it's true, was actually a Talmud Chacham. So uh, he, he, you know, he was a real uh, Talmud Chacham, unlike certain other Rebbe's. So put that on the record. Susanna mentions to me, which I did not know, I sang for you the song uh, that I learned in the Chabad camp, uh, um, the, the, the tune, um, how does it go again? Um, um, goodbye America, goodbye assimilation. Mashiach is coming to build a Jewish nation. She says that she remembers in the 60s in USY, this tune was sang to Lo Yisagoy al Goy Cherev. Okay, I did not know that, and uh, I, I mentioned that uh, if Chabad wants to take it from USY, they can. They've taken things that she points out where they took from the French national anthem as well. And uh, if anyone interested in that, uh, again, I got from Shemar, Nachum Shemar Yao, the whole story of how the Lubavitch Nugun from the French national anthem. I met one of our listeners in Borough Park last week. We had uh, brunch, I guess you would call it. And as we're leaving, we're walking around uh, Mordechai from Brooklyn. It was 1130. And I'm telling you this because this relates, we spoke about davening times among the Hasidim. And it's 1130 and we passed by, first of all, we passed by Amshinov. Amshinov, they could be davening at 2, 3 in the afternoon. But we passed by Munkach. And he says to me, I, I made a note of 1130, do you want to go see them davening Shachris? It's 1130 AM. And I checked it. Zmat Figo that day was 1025. So I said, okay, let's go in. So we went in and they're davening at 11.30 Shacharis. And he tells me that uh, they do this to 1.30, 2 p.m. coming in with uh, and davening Shacharis. So it troubled me because uh, Munkach, I, you know, the Munkach is not like the other Hasidim that they're, at least now they're the Rebbe, they're the Rebbe, Munchas Elazar, Chaim Elazar Shapiro, no relation to me, was a great posseic, a very interesting person. Uh, on the one hand, a big extremist, the, the, the leading anti-Zionist in Hungary. On the other hand, very friendly with the of Weinberg, uh, other things. Uh, and I wasn't sure that he would have uh, accepted this davening after this man. By the way, the whole idea of davening after Zman, there's really two reasons given. One is that there's hachana before tefillah, and you have to prepare yourself before davening. And the other is that you daven with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe's beyond time. Well, the Rebbe isn't there at 11.30. I was there, the Rebbe wasn't there, and there's no hachana. Believe me, these people, before they come to daven, they're going to the bank, they're getting their going at work, they're all, so it's completely non-halachic if you follow regular codified halacha as we know it. 
And this relates to my big point that uh, we'll talk about next semester that uh, even little violations of halacha would be accepted if you followed other things. So I went home and I looked up in the book, Darche Chaim V'Shalom, which is the book that gives a lot, a lot of stuff about the Munkat Rebbe. And I actually was sort of right, but not 100%. Because if you look on page 50, what it says is that the Rebbe was very medoctic, that um, he did not go for all this Hasidic stuff where they don't daven in the Zman. So that apparently would, my initial thought that uh, the Rebbe himself would not support what's going on. But then it says as follows. He says that um, he would daven, um, he says that, um, he says he wouldn't he would daven when he even with these Rebbe's who davened uh, way after the Zman, where would he daven? He would daven by himself, so he could daven before chatzos. But even that's not really halachic, because you have to daven chakras before, it's not, you don't, I mean, chatzos is a bit of odd. If you go to the Mai Zman and you'll see the times, there's actually Zman Tfilah of Shema, and they have Zman Tfilah of Amida for Shacharis, and then you have uh, Chatzos. So even davening after the Zman, 1025, I checked the day we were, I was in Brooklyn, Chatzos was 1250. So even that's not really mainstream, uh, at least uh, for us, uh, I think, halachically. But uh, as I said, Mordechai Brokman tells me that even 132, you go in there and they're davening, uh, and they're davening shachri. So thank you very much, Mordechai, for taking me there. I, um, I have to make a correction here. And I think also, um, I looked again at the articles. Well, first let me, um, we spoke about last class, this man, Rabbi Eliezer Kahneman, who's the uh, Nasi of Yeshivas Panevej. I said that he was the one uh, who was beaten up it's not true. It's his son. This, I read the article again. I, I just glanced at it. What happened was his son was trying to clear the way for Rebbe Ezer here to daven um, Mincha. And it was his son, Rev Label, who was beaten and had to go to the hospital. Uh, so whether they would have actually beat uh, the Nasi of the yeshiva, also give shiurim. Rev Label just works. He's like a, a bureaucrat. Uh, that I don't know. However, Joel pointed out, which I did not know, that... Um, in the, um, I guess this is 19, um, I guess in the 50s, this was that uh, Rabbi Kahneman lived in America with his father and he went to Hailai. And uh, Joel was in his class and uh, this was in Far Rockaway. So um, I, I didn't know about that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, oops, I didn't have the picture here. Let me show you here. Uh, hold on. Uh, I thought I had the picture on the screen. Let me show you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Here's the screen of Rabbi uh, Kahaneman. Um, but a number of you asked me, well, isn't this uh, what happened in, uh, isn't this what happened in Tells? I looked it up. I hear you have the book, um, which has everything. Lithuanian Yeshivas in the 19th Century by Shaul Stamfer. Well, first of all, you have in Volusian. I, I didn't see any attacking of rabbis. Um, and Rev. Label, okay, he's a, he works in the office, but he's still a rabbi. Uh, what you have is, you see on page 222, Rev. Chaim Berlin giving a shear, the students disrupting it. It does say once he was physically prevented from going up and giving the shear. So I guess that comes pretty close. And also, and that's in Volusian, in Tells, on 317, he discusses how um, that one of the rabbis uh, was harassed when he started teaching um, there was a revolt, um, lights were shattered, things like that. So um, it's, uh, and there was violence, uh, I guess, between the students, but uh, so I guess it does come pretty close. Okay, one more thing, my friends, or two more things. I have to, another correction. I, I, I said that in Germany, and uh, we have some German Jews here, there was, I thought there's only four or five communities that were separatists. I think the reason I said this is because in Judith Blake's article, Rabbinic Responses to Non-Observance, she gives only four separatist communities on page 87, Berlin, Wiesbaden, Darmstadt, and Mainz, and of course is Frankfurt, so five. I think maybe that's where I thought that. But there's a few more. I looked in uh, this book, uh, Mordechai Breuer, The Social History, Modernity Within Tradition, Social History of Orthodox Jewry, on page uh, 218, 219, and he mentions there's some others. You in small towns, Elberfeld, actually in Konigsberg, which is not so small, um, Stuttgart and Kassel. So, uh, 
and Firth. So we had 10 or 11 that I count now separatists. Most communities were not. Even when you have a, even when you have a community that's, uh, um, in fact, uh, Jeez, does she, does Blech say Mainz? Yeah, Mainz. Even when you have a community, people might tell you about an Orthodox synagogue. That doesn't mean it's separatist community. It just means there's an Orthodox synagogue. But so you have maybe 11 communities like this. Um, um, we'd have to be an interesting project to put together a whole list of them. And finally, the last thing I want to tell you for someone who asked me, I can send it to you. If you want to know about Rabbi Huda Chassid, this idea of taking out. Um, just to clarify, if you look in this book, Sifune Tzioni, in the introduction, he discusses the idea that uh, the, um, the Halah Gadol was taken out of uh, the Torah and put into Hillim. And if you look at the Lashon of Rabbi Huda Hasid, also quoted by Tzioni, it says they took it out of the Chumash. So that he wants to say that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote things in a chumash that weren't in the Siddur, and that's what it's referring to. It's, it's dochak, to use the rabbinic term. And that's why Moshe said it's heretical, but that's, uh, that's what I referred to for the person who asked. Okay, everyone, let us... Uh, we now are in the appendix of the book. Um, I introduced you to uh, last class, where it's page 356. Um, I introduced you to an individual. Here is his picture. Um, his name is Yona Emmanuel. There you uh, you can see a Wikipedia entry on him, and here's what he looks like. He was a uh, very interesting individual, Holocaust survivor, originally from Germany. The family went to Holland. He wrote his uh, his autobiography. Well, his memoir is called Yusupar Lador. You know, tell it to, um, you know, the generation out here. You can see his inscription to me, Leah Didi, Ramel Shapiro. Um, this book, incidentally, he was Zoha to something very few people are, of uh, Shlomo Zalman Auerbach would read this on, uh, or at least read it on um, uh, Tisha B'av, and he recommended for people to read it. Who was Yona Emanuel? Born in 1925, so he could almost be my grandfather. He was, as I said, a Holocaust survivor from the, you know, right in the middle of a German Orthodoxy, he comes to Israel, uh, is trained as an optician and works. Uh, he was the editor of the Torah journal Hamayan. He was a typical example of an old fashioned German Jew who worked for a living and yet in all of his free time studied Torah. This model, which uh, is very, when I say a germ typical, I I'm, take the typical at least uh, in a um, Platonic sense, but not really. Uh, most, um, as Rabbi Unterman once told Rabbi Chirik of Weinberg on a trip to Berlin, the problem with German Orthodoxy is there's a lot of Derech Eretz and not as much Torah. But at least that was the model um, which they wanted. And you did have many individuals who are like that, people who worked and yet on their free time, it's not like typical American Orthodoxy, watching TV, doing things like that. It's like uh, if you go to serious places and maybe like in Teaneck or other places, people come on to listen to Torah in motion. I mean, you always had that in Germany. You always had people who were, uh, who were working class people or blue collar even. You had in Germany, you had uh, people who lived in you had rural communities. You know, people worked the land and all sorts of things. And you always had people who were, who devoted lots of time to Torah study, who were not professional rabbis and didn't go to yeshivas. And Yonah Emanuel is the best of like that tradition. He comes to Israel, although he works as an optician. Every night he'd be learning. He wrote, they published, he wrote many articles. They put them together. He published some uh, a safer on Shemitah. I mean, a a real, real Talmud Chacham, and he very close to Roshon Zaman Arbach, but he made his mark in editing a Torah journal, the Torah journal Hamayan. So um, here is the English title page of it, but it's a Hebrew journal. Uh, it, it's been coming out, what well, began in the 1950s, then it stopped for about 10 years, and under Emmanuel's, uh, who passes away in 2002, under his editorship, it continued uh, and continues to this day after his passing, edited by Rav Yoel Katan. That's the son of the Katan who um, uh, edited the Loaze Rashi, the uh, the French words in Rashi. He wrote the book on it, Moshe Katan. Katan is Klein, like we saw with Menashe Klein. Um, so he edited it, and it comes out four times a year. It's a 
Torah journal, but also like an academic Torah journal. And it represents the best in German Orthodoxy. Note the, um, the transliteration. As I've uh, mentioned to you before, the word is Mayan. There's a, uh, there's a Shiva under the Ayan. And they, they, they pronounce it, they have it properly here. It's not Hamayan, it's Hamayan. And if you don't know the journal, I, it, they're all online now. Uh, it's put out uh, through the Yeshiva Shalvim. You can see uh, all the issues full of uh, fascinating materials. Uh, the, the Poro, as I've also mentioned to you in the past is, well, you can see it here in Pesach 18. What does it say? Uvtoch bekaot mayanot. Not ma'ayanot. I've mentioned this already before about the school here. They get it wrong. They, they pronounce it wrong. They spell it wrong. The school in Tinek. It's not ma. By the way, everyone pronounces it ma'ayanot. No one actually pronounces it ma'ayanot. But the way it's written is incorrect. It's not ma'ayanot. The, the Hebrew, it's ma'ayanot. And I, I just was looking because I defined my note. And lo and behold, there is, a, there is a school in Israel. I don't know anything about this school, uh, but uh, seminary, I guess, for girls. And they get it right. It's, it's, it's my note, not uh, my note. But uh, I bet you there's plenty of people in TNAC who think that it, we all pronounce it my note, but it's wrong. It should be my note. What's well, actually the reverse? <laughs> they're, they're pronouncing it correctly, and my note is wrong. Um, I began around, the well, first time I saw the journal, uh, my young was at Brandeis University and immediately I thought this was great stuff. And I, I started corresponding with the editor. So this takes us back to like 1988 or something. And for the neck till his death, about 16 years, we corresponded. It's not like the other letters in the book where I was asking a lot of questions. This was just, he became my friend. We only met a few times when I came to Israel. The last time I was in Israel was around 2000. I stayed at his house for Shabbos, just myself, uh, him and his wife. And But I had correspondence with him for many, many years. Uh, I, I can't find some of the letters, but I probably have about 35 letters. And uh, when I published them, after he passed away, it was a great shock. I get the journal four times a year. It comes to my house. I open it up and it mentions he passed away. This is before really the internet that you would know all these things uh, so quickly. It was a great shock. It was, even the Shoshin was passed. Uh, so I decided to put together the letters, not the personal ones, and just uh, the selections, which I'll read to you certain selections, which I think had uh, interest, wider interest, and it did. Many people found it interesting and contacted me. The family didn't even know about it. And uh, we just, uh, like I said, we were friends, uh, even though he could have been my grandfather almost, because uh, he's 41 years older than me. We would correspond all the time, talk about this and that, and uh, just like this republic of letters. So I'm just going to go through, because it's not just personal stuff. We discuss the issues of the day, and I think you'll find it interesting, and you get a sense of what was going on in Israel and the religious world. So let me just talk about some of the things um, uh, that we wrote about, and uh, just go through the letters in... Um, a chronological order uh, from the first one that I included, which is from 1992. I, uh, I began to publish. I published a number of things in Hamayan, letters of great German rabbis that I found. Um, and one of the things I, including Rabbi Chayak of Weinberg, letters from Rabbi Weinberg. So I had letters, I found letters from Rabbi Weinberg to Shaul Berlin. So sorry, Shaul Lieberman, who we'll talk about uh, the next, after this uh, series is done. So I asked him, can I publish the letters? Um, uh, from Rabbi Weinberg to Shaul Berlin, Shaul Lieberman, sorry, I keep saying Berlin. Uh, you know, Berlin, he comes from, he's married to a Berlin, uh, Shaul Lieberman, um, uh, Mayor Berlin, bar uh, daughter. This is what, this gives you a sense though that this isn't an academic journal. What does he say to me? He says, first of all, it's very valuable, worthwhile to publish the letters to Lieberman. He says, I knew Shaul Lieberman in his last years when he would visit Jerusalem and we even daven together. And I spoke to him. He says, the problem is that Shaul Lieberman stood at the head of the conservative rabbinical seminary. And in doing this, he abandoned Orthodox Judaism. Therefore, Hamayan, this journal, which is published by Paul Agudas Yisrael, we cannot publish these sorts of letters. Especially, we said, I can't publish it in the next issue when we're publishing letters from Hirsch 
in which he attacks um, those rabbis who were members of the French Alliance, because the French Alliance was, um, you know, it did also non-Orthodox things. It's as if, you know, rabbis, if Hirsch would have attacked rabbis who were members, for example, of federation, rabbinic committees or things like that. He says, you sent very interesting letters, but it makes sense, he says to me, that Hamayan wouldn't publish it, but you could publish it somewhere else. And then he says to me, it just shows you part of the problem with Shaul Lieberman will speak about next class. Great Torah scholar, unquestionably observant in all matters in his private life, but because of his involvement with the conservative movement, this created a bit of an issue in the Orthodox world, which we'll deal with. And in the next letter to me, he says, after I published letters already, he says, certainly we want you to publish more letters. And he says, there's also room to publish letters to Rabbi Weinberg. He says, a few years ago, Rabbi Neria published a book of letters to Rav Cook, a very important volume. He's referred to this volume. It's called Igrot Lareya. I'm holding the second edition from uh, uh, 1990. They published an earlier edition in 1985. Unfortunately, when the second edition came out, I gave the first edition to someone and uh, it was a mistake because the first edition had at the back, which this edition, this edition is much larger, but it doesn't have um, all the um, images of pictures that the first of letters. It just has a few, for example, like this, the actual letters. The first edition had the famous letters, the actual images of the Chazonish. When the Chazonish comes to Eretz Yisrael in 1934, I think it was, the first letters he writes are to Rav Kook asking him halacha questions about uh, laws dealing with the land of Israel. and. Uh, Th those are very important letters, and it shows you that who he thought was the, the, the posek in Eretz Yisrael that he has to ask the questions to when he first came there. Uh, this volume has all sorts of uh, great stuff because it has the letters of Rechai Moser and the Chavitz Chaim, all the people who were writing um, uh, to Rav Cook. I can tell you that the, although it is important historically, very important, has letters from Yechiyach of Weinberg also, uh, there was opposition to this book appearing by uh, Rabbi um, Tao from the um, the Kav, this group of extreme, uh, you know, followers of Rav Kook, because uh, part of the reason for publishing this book was they wanted to show that Rav Kook is part of the Torah world, and uh, which is obvious, to, but he, but today a lot of people don't realize that. If, you, if, if your Jewish knowledge of Jewish history is from Art Scroll, you won't realize, you know, who Rav Kook was and where he came from. Uh, Art Scroll published a biography of Rav Zunnenfeld. It's fine, you can publish a biography of Rav Zunnenfeld, but the idea that the yeshivas in America feel that Rav Zunnenfeld, uh, he was part of the separatist group. Didn't we mention last class that in Eretz Yisrael, the Gedolim, by and large, did not accept the separatist approach. They believed in being together in the community, just like uh, it was in Poland and Lithuania. Uh, but uh, Rabbi Tao's position was that we don't need to justify Rav Cook. We don't need to publish letters to show that uh, who Rav Cook was. But it's, I, I disagree with that. It still is a very important letter with uh, a volume with all sorts of, and, and we see different rabbis you wouldn't know. For example, Rav Zell Rugin Bengis. He was the head of the Eda Haridit, and you see how close he was to Rav Cook, and this is all Meltzer, etc. The next letter uh, he sends to me, I, um, I wanted to publish letters of Bechayek of Weinberg. In the end, he did agree to publish them, but at first he didn't want to because uh, uh, one, he had a correspondent to Rabbi Herzog. Rabbi Weinberg, if you recall, dealt with stunning animals before Shlita. And Rabbi Weinberg felt that technically it is permitted if you do it in the way he describes. And he and Rabbi Herzog turned to Rabbi Weinberg to discuss this because after World War II, there still was a problem in um, in Switzerland and in uh, Norway, places like that. Look, the way this country is going, I speak of America now, not Canada, because I don't know what goes on in Canada. But the way this country is going, you can be sure it's only a matter of time before you start hearing these so-called progressives talking about how... Uh, you know, uh, shlita is, is bad for animals and circumcision is, uh, is cruel and all that sort of stuff that it's, we're moving in that direction, believe it. Believe me, we are. In England, by the way, the Jews and the Muslims have been able to join together to work against these people trying to ban shlita and circumcision so that we might end up having to do that as well. But uh, Yonah Emanuel wonders whether this is appropriate to publish this because we're still in a battle 
over uh, over Shlita. And uh, if you start mentioning that there's rooms to permit, then uh, you know people will hear about this, and uh, they, that might put pressure because there were rabbis who thought that under certain circumstances it was, but this is only an emergency measure. We obviously don't want this, and we don't want to give them ammunition, but that's uh, what he discussed. Now, something else I published in uh, Hamayan was I published a letter, which I discovered at the Leo Beck Institute, which is a strong attack against Israel Hildesheimer and his yeshiva that he established in Eisenstadt. When we return, God willing, and we're going to return. In fact, we might even return. Stay tuned. Watch your Torah in Motion emails. There's a possibility there is a surprise trip. We'll see. If not, uh, well, maybe not. I say, but at least uh, if possible, there we, we might still be able to salvage something. But if not, definitely Morocco in January. But uh, be that as it may, God willing, next summer, 2022, we should all be alive and healthy. I see Harvard is already advertising, and we'll start advertising. We'll go back to Central Europe, and one of the places we go is Eisenstadt. Eisenstadt in Austria, great, great Jewish city, cemetery smack in the middle of the city. This was Nazi territory. One of the things you see when you go to these countries is right in the middle of the city, prime real estate, you have Jewish cemeteries. And you got to ask yourself, what the Nazis, what they, 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 why did they destroy these cemeteries? But, uh, and we spoke about, I spoke about Eisenstadt. And one of the things about, Eisenstadt was closed on Shabbos. They actually shut it down and cars couldn't go through. Uh, uh, there was an Erev. Um, all the things I'll show you when we're there. But this was the first yeshiva to teach secular studies in Western Europe, or Central Europe, I should say, it's established by Israel Hildesheimer, who was there for a long time before he comes to Berlin. But uh, there were people who didn't like it, especially in Hungary. Eisenstadt was part of Hungary then, controlled, Austrian-Hungarian Empire uh, was controlled by Hungary. And uh, I found a letter. It was like a seven-page letter, a harsh attack, really a chutzpahdik attack against Israel Hildesheimer. Not much different than you'll find in, let's say, uh, Rafael Lichtenstein or others uh, attacking Israel Hildesheimer. So I sent it. I, I think this is interesting, though. It shows you the battles that were taking place in uh, Hungary, where Israel Hildesheimer led the moderate element of orthodoxy in Hungary, and things eventually, it was too difficult for him, and he ends up leaving and going to Berlin. It, he didn't want to fight all the time. The original story is, is it's told about Rav Solveitchik, but it was originally said about Rabbi Israel Hodesheimer. He had a PhD, he wrote on scholarship. So uh, when he finally met one of these Hungarian extremist rabbis who was impressed by meeting him, and uh, he, he said to him, Where do you find the time? You're such Tom Hachem. Where do you find the time to do all your academic stuff? He says, During the time that you're uh, speaking Lush and Har about me, that's when I uh, devote myself to these non Torah matters. That's, that was originally said about Israel Hildesheimer, as far as I know, uh, but it, it somehow morphed into Rabbi Soloveitchik. If you watch the movie on Rabbi Soloveitchik, put up by Ethan Eisberg, the documentary, uh, the story is told from J.J. Schachter, I believe, that, uh, that Rabbi Soloveitchik said this to someone. Well, maybe Rabbi Soloveitchik did, but he was just uh, using something which was famous, uh, already said about uh, Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer. Uh, so I thought this was important. This is a letter that shows what was in the minds of the opposition, the extremist opposition to Rabbi Israel Hildesheimer. And there was a good deal of opposition, even though many Gedolim sent their children to study with Israel Hildesheimer, because even though these were Gedolim from Hungary, they realized that it's a new world and they want their sons to know German and they want their sons to know mathematics. Israel Hildesheimer taught mathematics. They want them to know, know about the world. And when I say know about the world, this is the, the sort of stuff they were teaching there is like anyone who goes to Chaim Berlin or Tar Vadas or Mir High School in America was getting. I mean, we're not talking about university studies here. We're talking about the basic sort of curriculum that every Haredi, not Hasidic, I should say, every non-Hasidic high school in America Philadelphia, all these places, they all, this is what they were teaching. It's taken for granted today. There's nothing controversial. But they, uh, they were like there were the schools in Israel that didn't teach anything. Uh, so I published this. What uh, Yon Emanuel writes to me is that Professor Mordechai Breuer, whose book I just referred to a few minutes ago, there's two Mordechai Breuers. There's the Mordechai Breuer, the uh, professor, the son of Isaac Breuer, who was the, the expert in, uh, first of all, the ex, an expert in the history of Ashkenazic Jewry, German Jewry, and in particular, Torim Der Heretz, his great-grandfather, Shimshon, Shamshon, like, yeah, I was saying Shimshon, for uh, 30 years uh, before uh, Naftali corrected me. So it's going to take me a while to get it out of my head. But uh, 
he was the great grandson of Shamshon Farah. She wrote the classic essay. I can send it to anyone. I have it on PDF of what Torah and Derech Eretz is. Uh, and uh, he wrote that this, the classic work, uh, written, wrote it in German for whatever reason. I don't know why. He knew English fluently, having been in England during the war on uh, German orthodoxy, but he also wrote about medieval Ashkenazi Jewry. I got to know him um, and um, I visited him and uh, I'm grateful. I, I wrote, you Google his name and my name, I wrote an obituary uh, after he passed away. He gave me certain stuff. I guess he figured that I would be the one to publish it, and I haven't yet published it, dealing with the controversy about the Amsterdam rabbi, Rabbi Dunner, and his commentary on the Talmud, which was like a quasi-critical um, edition. I think I mentioned this before. This is Rabbi Dunner of Amsterdam. He was a big Talmud Chacham and a post but he also wrote commentary on the Talmud. You can uh, get it, published by Mosheder of Cook. But in there, he engages in uh, critical study, like uh, the idea that the the Amarayim didn't always have all the facts, and therefore sometimes we give a different explanation. He gives a different explanation to explain the Mishnah than the Amarayim did, uh, than the Amarayim explained. What really made him controversial was he said that the Amarayim were, or at least the, the, the editors of the Talmud, were taken in by the heretics. What do I mean by that? He said there's certain stories in the Talmud that were stuck in there by the heretics, and people take it seriously. So, for example, like there's the story of a man, if he falls off a building and has sex on the way down, you know, what's the halacha? Or if um, the story of how, uh, who was it, is it Rava or Rav, who appears in a city and says, I want a woman for the night? which, you know, that story, he says that these were all meant to mock the rabbis and somehow they got stuck into the Talmud. And uh, <laughs> uh, so on the one hand, you say that's a pious thing for him to say. On the other hand, what he's saying is that all the Rishonim and Acharonim have been misled. So there was a movement to actually put his commentary in Cherim and Professor Breuer gave me all the information. I have it on my floor right behind. One day I'll, I'll put it together. So I'm grateful that at least he had confidence in me, despite what I'm going to tell you he said right now, and that he, he gave it to me as I'm the person he thought to publish it. So I, one day I will. Um, but he was very upset about this letter that I published. And uh, he wrote me a letter. And he said that, um, why do we, here you have Israel Hildesheimer, one of the Godolim. And here we're publishing an ignorant, idiotic letter by some unknown person, uh, you know, attacking the, um, the yeshiva in Eisenstadt, why should we do that? And I was shocked to get that from him, a historian, because here this is a primary document going on for pages after pages, which gives you insight into what the extremist elements in Hungary were thinking, why they were so opposed to Rev. Israel Hildesheimer's institution. Uh, it's like today. If some idiot writes a long thing against YU with all this crazy stuff, we, we look at it, we'll throw it out. It means nothing. But if in 150 years we discover it and then it gives us insight, then it has value. It's like Shaul Lieberman said when he introduced, he didn't like Kabbalah, he introduced uh, Gershom Sholem. He said that nonsense is nonsense, but the history of nonsense is scholarship. Well, that's the same thing. We read polemics. Today we find stuff in the Geniza, medieval stuff, and uh, of course it's nonsense, but uh, at the time it's nonsense, but today it's, it's history. Incidentally, since I mentioned Geniza, let me mention something else about Yon Emanuel. He, had, he has a wonderful family. His son-in-law is, uh, one of his sons-in-law is Rabbi uh, Zev Whiteman, who's the, uh, the Mashkiach at Tenuva and Halachic writer, but he has a son named Simcha Emanuel. Simcha Emanuel, who's the son-in-law of Eric Zimmer. Some of you might know the name Rabbi Eric Zimmer from YU, student of the Rav. He's been in Israel forever, also an expert in the Ashkenazic Jewry on the Maharil and others. Simcha Emanuel, who has been extremely, extremely prolific. He just came out with another book uh, of his essays. He has a classic article on Rav of Rottenberg and showing that it's really a legend that um, he, he, he refused to be freed, uh, um, refused to be ransomed. But he's written so much on Ashkenazi Jewry, but he's written two groundbreaking volumes. And why is this related to Geniza? Because we all know the Geniza in Cairo which was discovered uh, in the, the show in Cairo, which uh, I, I have to go back. I haven't been there in decades. But uh, there's another Geniza, which they talk about now, the European Geniza. Lo and behold, about 15 years ago, people working in libraries, in archives in Europe, began to notice that in many, let's say, old Latin texts and other texts, the paper used to be very expensive. You know, they used uh, parchment. And what would they use? 
they would steal Jewish books. They would kick Jews out of cities and they would confiscate everything and they'd rip it up and they'd use for the binding or for the inner pages or the other sides, they would use parchment. And they didn't care because they're writing Latin. So all you do is you write on one side. Lo and behold, the other sides and the bindings are Hebrew. These are Hebrew from books that were, as I said, confiscated or found. Jews were killed. They took it because it was very valuable, this stuff. They didn't burn it. And that is known as the European Geniza. And um, Simcha Emanuel was really the leader in the study of the European Geniza. They found you know, individual pages. They found pages after pages of material, lost halachic writings. There's a whole literature that has now been discovered. And we know it as the European Geniza. And he has published two volumes with notes of this material. So it really is a very significant find that we are in the midst of. He's been traveling to the various libraries of Europe, the, you know, the archives, the monasteries, and because this is in its beginnings, the study of, and it's just like the, uh, the Cairo Geniza where you have uh, fragments here, fragments there, there, there you don't have fragments, but you have a page here and the other page could be in another library in Austria and this one could be in Germany. And he's really doing uh, groundbreaking work and that's uh, Jonah Emanuel's son. But so the, Mordechai Breuer, he was upset. Why would I publish this thing? And uh, I guess I should uh, feel uh, honored that he wrote to me, you know, to tell me that he, he was upset, but it did upset me and I didn't understand it. And really Jonah Emanuel didn't understand it either. He said, he, he says, we received a, he said, Professor Breuer told me that he opposed the publication of the anonymous letter against the Eisenstadt Yeshiva. I said to him, I replied to him, just like in Hamayan, we publish criticisms of the great Lithuanian Yeshivas, which they did. They have published. Uh, there's room, you know, that they that they don't teach secular studies or they're not involved in the community as a whole, that sort of thing. He says there's also room to publish a criticism issue of Eisenstadt. And the fact that we don't know who wrote it doesn't, doesn't matter. Exactly what I thought. That's what he wrote. And then he says, I also heard that the family of the uh, Hildesheimer, the Hildesheimer family, who I, not only did I, did I know, I do know. I know Mayor Hildesheimer, who's the great grandson of Israel Hildesheimer. Um, I know others. They also were uh, upset by it. And but Jonah says, in my opinion, there was another reason to publish this, not just historical reason that I mentioned to show the, uh, the, the, the opposition. What's the other reason? To show that Rabbi Hirsch was not the only one who supported Torah and Derech Heretz in Germany. Many people don't know the history. They think of Torah and Derech Heretz, they think of Shamshan Rafa Hirsch. But it's not just Shamshan Rafa Hirsch. You have Israel Hildesheim, you have, uh, you have many others. And there's a big dispute between Israel Hildesheim and Shamshan Rafa Hirsch because Israel Hildesheim believes in academic Jewish studies where Hirsch opposes it. I also had sent, at the same time, I sent uh, a copy of my doctoral dissertation to, uh, uh, just when it was about to be completed, uh, to uh, what I had done to Emmanuel. And I wrote about uh, Rabbi Chayek of Weinberg as a Lithuanian great rabbi, you know, who discovers and becomes the leading advocate of Turm Der Heretz. In opposition, at the very time this was happening in the 20s and the 30s, German Orthodox youth, many of the German Orthodox youth were abandoning Torah and Derech Eretz and becoming yeshivish. And he says to me that uh, what you wrote about Rabbi Weinberg becoming a Torah and Derech Eretz Jew at the same time that the German Orthodox were, um, were leaving this, there is much truth in this. But then he says, but I think that most Orthodox uh, German Jews did not abandon Torah and Derech Eretz, but they came to the conclusion that the approach needed to be fixed, that is a tikkun. He, they saw that they, um, they exaggerated it, that what I said before, more derech Eretz than Torah. When I speak about the abandonment of Torah and derech Eretz, I'm talking about the young people, the, yeshiva, the people who went to the yeshivas, the idealistic young, just like we might speak about idealistic young people in, in, in the West who become Zionists and want to move to Israel, that sort of thing, you know, don't want to live in America or Canada. It's much more an issue, I'd say, in England, where there's a whole brain drain. All the, you know, the best and the brightest of the youth there, they all end up going to Israel. It's not, we have some of that in, in America and Canada as well, uh, but uh, very much so in Europe. Uh, 
that's what I was referring to in Germany. These were the people who went to the yeshivas, and when they came back, I read about it in chapter four, they didn't want Torim Derech Eretz, this bourgeois German lifestyle where you're a Shomer Shabbos and everything, but you also go to the opera and you read Goethe and Heine and all that, especially with the rise of the anti-Semitism, they wanted something different. Some of them went to Zionism and others went to the yeshiva world. They even founded an organization called Torah Umusar, in opposition to Torah and Derech Eretz. It was out of this whole movement, this ideology, that Rabbi Shimon Schwab writes his famous letter asking the Gdolim of the East, does the Torah and Derech Eretz approach still apply anymore? He later regretted that and saw that as a youthful indiscretion of his, that he would have such chutzpah to say, you know, does this Hirsch's ideas. But he was reflecting this approach that maybe this was only an emergency measure. Uh, So that, that's what he talks about that later. The next letter, this is from Kislev, 1994. I had sent him, I had sent him the material because uh, that's what we do, used to do. I would send him stuff that he, it's not like you have the internet. Uh, so after Rabbi Soloveitchik passed away, there was a big dispute at the funeral. We spoke about it. You'll, uh, my, I have a blog post coming up, uh, which I include, it's going to be a number of um, uh, installments, but I, it's about the dispute over of Soloveitchik's death. Some people might be upset that I'm sort of raising this and bringing it up again, but it, for me, it's history. Why was it that the Lakewood crowd boycotted of Soloveitchik's funeral? There was a whole debate in the Algamainer Journal about this. I, I showed you where Ravar and Soloveitchik wrote, so I want to set, you know, set it out historically, so uh, preserve for posterity, because I now have copies of all the Algamainer Journal articles, which you can't get online. So I have copies of all of them, and uh, and believe it or not, after seeing the story, you will be much more sympathetic to the Jewish observer. I know they were attacked for what they did, but wait till you hear what the order from Eretz Yisrael was, from their Gadoli or their Gadol, I should say, that you should not even mention Rabbi Soloveitchik's death. He should be totally ignored. So when you, when you see it in the whole context, you'll see that the Jewish observer actually did the best they could have done under the circumstances, and I think you have to admire the late Rabbi Wolpin, that he was able to go as far as he did to giving some acknowledgement to the great Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, upon his passing. But stay tuned, uh, that, that's going to be coming. But I sent him all the material, Yon Emanuel. So he writes to me, it's very interesting, this dispute around Rabbi Soloveitchik. He says, unfortunately, the Haredi circles don't, they don't know what it is to have a, an intellectual argument. Everything has to become personal, every, you know, just to argue the matter, he says. He says, it's their zechut not to accept for Soloveitchik as the manhigador, as the leader of generation. But why, why to degrade him? He said, I heard a, a, a taina, a, a, a reason, I should say, or a complaint. In my opinion, a correct one, he says. The Rabbi Soloveitchik did not require uh, married women to cover their hair, and he was also in favor of rabbis or synagogues joining in organizations with Orthodox and conservative. Now, as for the second one, uh, it is not true. He was, and I, I can say this having spoken to people who were involved in it. He, it is not correct to say that he was in favor of interdenominational rabbinic boards. He was not. He did not tell his students they couldn't be in it. That doesn't mean he was in favor. It doesn't mean he supported it. It doesn't mean he even saw it as a positive thing, but he left it to the local rabbi. If the local rabbi thought that something of value could happen, he didn't. He never came out with the Yisur and he didn't sign the Yisur and saying there was anything wrong. It was forbidden to be in the New York Board of Rabbis. In fact, I was told that his attitude was, if you ask me, you shouldn't. But if you want to, although in Germany, they also had this. In Germany, there were two rabbinic uh, organizations, one which had non-Orthodox and one which only had Orthodox. And if you were a member of the one that had the non-Orthodox rabbis, you couldn't be a member of the one, the, the, the Frankfurt one, uh, the Hersheyan one, which had the, um, uh, the, the other Orthodox rabbis. However, I can also tell you that Rav Soloveitchik was in favor and did think it was positive, the Synagogue Council of America, and that the OU should be involved in a, a, a group like that, because these organizations, the, they'd help fight anti-Semitism, and uh, it's dealing with important matters, uh, getting money for yeshivas, some, you know, that sort of thing. Now, as for the other one, that there, he did not uh, 
insist on covering hair. If you read Rav Shechter's uh, Nefesh Arav, he says that's not true, that Rav Soloveitch did require it. On the other hand, Rabbi Rakefet has said on numerous occasions that um, Rabbi Sol, and not just Rabbi Rakefet, but Rabbi Soloveitch was very, there was a great rabbi in Hartford. His name was uh, Rav Yitzchak Hurwitz. He wrote a, a wonderful commentary on the, uh, he was in the 30s, he died in the 40s. His son was Isaac, not Isaac, his son was Professor Hurwitz from Columbia. He was an, a Middle Eastern expert. But this is Yitzchak uh, Hurwitz. He wrote, it's called Yad HaLevi. And it's a great commentary on the uh, Sefer HaMitzvot. two volumes. Uh, anyone who studies Sefer HaMitzvot or Rambam should know this. Very thick book. Uh, they reprinted it. The family reprinted it about 15 years ago. In there, he argues that, uh, just like our Messas we spoke about earlier, he argues that it's uh, the ha women's hair covering is uh, dependent on the time, the era, what is typically done. And Rabbi Rekefet has said uh, numerous occasions, I can even send you the links to Shirim where he says this, because I, I made notes of it, that Rabbi Soloveitchik, who had great respect for uh, Rabbi Hurwitz, he accepted this argument. Now, I heard from someone that uh, apparently Rav Lichtenstein said, but later on in his life, he changed his mind and he did insist on it. I don't know. But at least Rabbi Rekefet said, and Rabbi Rekefet asked Rabbi Lichtenstein about this. Well, then why, did the, why do married women cover their hair in the shul? And Rav Lichtenstein said, it's a halacha in the Kedushan space of Knesset, that it's separate, that that's a halacha in the shul. So whether, but that's at least where Rekhefet says that this was the Rav's position. He's not the only one who held that. And um, Rabbi and Yonah Manuel says, I'm too bad that he had this position if it's true. But um, that's not the reason he says why the Haredim opposed him. There were, there were, I don't need to mention names here, but there were big uh, Rashi Yeshiva and rabbis from the Haredi world whose wives also didn't cover their hair. I don't know if they halachically said you don't have to, but their wives definitely did not. And uh, um, but he says, um, Yon Emanuel says, it appears to me that the opposition is from a different reason why they opposed him. And listen to this. And this is from someone who never studied with Rav Soloveitchik, who, although his brother wrote me a letter after I published this, his brother, uh, who, who was, lived on kibbutz uh, um, Shalvim, um, what's his name now? Uh, Shmuel, I think it was. He wrote me a letter that he, once he came to America, and the highlight of his trip to America is he went to one of the Rav's uh, a Saturday Night Shirim in Boston. Uh, I probably should have included that letter also when I published it. Um, but this, his only connection to Rav Soloveitchik was he learned Bechavrusa with his Mechutan, Eric Zimmer, who was a big student. And of course, he read Rav Soloveitchik's writings. He says, it appears to me that the opposition to Rav Soloveitchik comes from something else. Who? Veraku. Only Rav Soloveitchik. Hitzliach hachanech dor gadol shorabanim orthodoxim. Only he uh, produced, was able to succeed in educating an entire generation of Orthodox rabbis who have nothing to do with the Aguda. And therefore, they opposed him in his lifetime and also after his death. That is, Rabbi Soloveitchik trained a generation of rabbis who were not beholden to the Haredi rabbinic leadership, to the Das Torah of the, uh, the Haredi rabbinate. That's what made him so dangerous. I would only add a point that I've said already in previous classes. Rabbi Soloveitchik is a more complicated case because, first of all, he comes from base brisk. He comes from the center of you know, of the most important Torah family for the Litvish world. And to make it even worse, he was a member of the Buddhist Israel. He was a member of the Mowetzis Kedolia Torah in America in the 40s. And then he breaks with them. And not only does he break, it would have been bad enough if he just broke with them quietly and said, I don't want to be an Agudist anymore. He gives a whole drusha in which he sets forth in the way that only he could do with his brilliance why he left the Aguda. And not only does he say why he left the Aguda, he explains why the Aguda is missing the boat. And, uh, and uh, it's only the Mizrahi. And just like Joseph and his 12 brothers, so you have all the brothers, but who's right? Joseph's right. And his name is Joseph also. And in this matter, he says, it doesn't matter. You tell me all the Gedolim oppose Mizrahi because sometimes God himself poskins. And after the Holocaust, God was telling us that we need a state and we need to relate differently. And uh, so he's, um, when he, he, not only does he go against the Aguda, he says that God himself, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is telling us that you Agudist rabbis have missed the boat. And not only have you missed the boat, my own grandfather, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that. He never really went and said that. He did say that his grandfather didn't see the significance of the emigration to America and other things, but um, his whole idea is that the Holocaust has shown us that um, we need a different approach. Rav Chaim lived before the Holocaust. So yes, his uncle missed the boat. 
Revelvel, but you can't say that about Rechaim, because Rechaim, I guess the Rav would have thought that Rechaim, if he was alive, he would have changed his mind also. That's uh, one more letter. Um, yeah, we're about halfway through. One more letter. This goes from 1995. I just read it to you to get a sense. So here's someone, as I said, a Torah and Derech Eretz Jew, who learned every single week with Rav Shomo Zaman Arbach for decades. So you have to know who Rav Shomo Zaman Arbach was, uh, respected by all camps. He gave a shear to Balabatim. When you say I don't mean like your local rabbi gives a uh, you know, Tuesday night shear uh, where the people come with their Arstral Gemaras. I'm talking about Balabatim, who guys who learned for years in yeshiva or on their own, who are big Talmud Chachamim. Those type of Balabatim, who uh, are few and far between, but uh, you have them definitely in Jerusalem. Uh, he says, and well, this will be the last letter I do, he goes, the death of Mori this is, he, he this is what he writes to me. Because as I said, we engaged in this nonstop correspondence back and forth. So uh, just like I felt I had to share things with him, he felt he had to share things with me. Um, it's a very unusual relationship. And now that I think about it, uh, I was a young kid and he's an established Talmud Chacham, an editor, an author, and he's sending me all these letters. I feel unbelievably privileged that, uh, uh, that I received these letters. He says that the passing of Marie Varabi of Shom Zaman Arbach is a great loss to the, all of Jewish people. Many years will come until another great person arises like him. A great Gaon in Halacha and in understanding, you know, the most the, the technical, most complicated technical questions in electricity and medicine. We know there of Shom Zaman Arbach. He was the, the person to write about electricity and to know all these matters. Uh, accepted by all Torah Jewry. Also very unusual. Where do you find it? Today, I think you can say maybe Rav Asher Weiss, who's a great, great Torah scholar, not at the level of Shomaz Arbach, but uh, certainly a great, great Torah scholar, one of the great post scheme of our time. Uh, um, but where do you find people like this who are accepted by all groups? Uh, a true uh, modest person, uh, great intellect. He says, I learned with him more than 30 years, every Sunday night. I'm going to write about the next issue of Hamayan after the Hespate of his Talmud Mufak, Rabbi Neuwirth, Rabbi Neuwirth, from German Orthodox stock. His father was uh, a German Orthodox. He, he's, uh, he wrote the Shmir Shabbos Kol Chasa, a book that almost, rev I could say, almost or even did revolutionize uh, the study of laws of Shabbos. Uh, it became one of those classic books that everyone uh, had to buy. Uh, the funeral was something unimaginable. Hundreds of thousands from all segments of Orthodox Jewry and then tens of eulogies in all the areas of Jerusalem. Marie Varabi told me 25 years ago how greatly he respected Rav Kook. When Rosh Hashanah Arbach spoke and he said the Rav, the Rav meant Rav Kook. Rav Shomo Zaman Arbach came from Rav Kook's camp. Rav Kook was the Masada Kedushin at his wedding. Uh, and he was in Rav Kook's, his father was a, also already in the uh, father from the, the, the Kabbalistic Yeshiva, Shar Shemayim. Uh, they were all from Rav Kook's group. He said that he told the story of Shomo Zaman that once this zealot tried to come into Rav Kook's house and scream at him. And outside he heard how Rav Kook was learning a parak chapter of Tanakh, he heard and was stopped in his tracks. Rav Kook was learning with such hitra avut that this uh, extremist was convinced there's nothing, you know, I, I can't go scream at Rav Kook. Who will give us his uh, replacement? He says Rav Shomo Zalman Arbach was not a Turim Derech Eretz person. He was not a Zionist. And nevertheless, he was close to everyone. Everyone came to consult with him. Um, you could be a Ben Yeshiva from the great yeshivas or someone who came out of the religious high schools, uh, the Tichon, Yeshiva Tichonit, or uh, who want to ask him which yeshiva has there to go to. When it came to Shemitah, he uh, advised many people who observed the, the, the Shvi, you know, Shemitah on the kibbutzim and he stood by them. And I'll just add something that Yon Emanuel doesn't add. At the same time, he said that we can't get rid of the Heter Mechira because today you cannot run a state without the Heter Mechira. So for those who can follow the Shemitah law is fine, but you can't ask all the farms and everything to go along with that. And therefore we, we still, and he writes about it in his Sefer about the Heter Mechira. 
Okay, uh, I will. I will stop here. Uh, the next week, we'll get into some more layers, including a little political. We do as redundancy. Hoffman, the Meiri, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen. Do you know the name Daniel Jonah Goldhagen and his work? We'll see what Yona Emanuel has to say about that, and um, and then it's Siv. What does the Nitziv have to say? Sec uh, so some other uh, other important stuff. We'll see if we can't finish it next class. We'll finish it the class after. But uh, as always, good stuff. Let me take the comments, the questions. I see there's many here. Um, Baruch says that uh, Canadians can be protected by the um, United States depravity if the restrictions are permanent. <laughs> Baruch, you live in America, although uh, Canada has had some good prime ministers. Believe me, they have enough of their... If it, it, Depravity means in terms of views of Israel and things like that. We're one group here. Um, Yaakov Yell, Rabbi Gorin wrote in his autobiography that his parents came to Israel with the Abona Rebbe, which Penny Bodiner wrote about, which you just mentioned. Yes, uh, thank you for rem reminding me of that. The parents, Rav Shlomo Gorin grew up in Kfar Hasidim before they moved to Jerusalem. The Abona Rebbe, if you haven't seen the video, just Google Abona Rebbe, it's like 25 minutes. I was thinking about the Abana Rebbe, because remember, I told you the story last week about the Rebbe, the, the Zionist Rebbe, who um, I showed you the videos, and I told you that he lived in the Shomer at Seir Kibbutz in the 50s and 60s. Um, and <laughs> how could you live in the Shomer at Seir Kibbutz? I'm, the Abana Rebbe, the story is amazing, because he is a Hasidic Rebbe who um, abandons his uh, flock, uh, becomes George Nagel out in California, totally irreligious, and then comes back. Uh, I wonder if this Hasidic Rebbe, the Zionist Rebbe, if he, the, the son-in-law, the Vishnu Rebbe, and uh, the daughter, the Vishnu Rebbe, is his wife, if they too, because how could they move to Shomer Atzir Kibbutz, uh, if they too didn't really abandon Torah Judaism and then come back, and now we're being told the story that even when they're in Shomer Atzir Kibbutz, they still were secretly, that's what they say, secretly observant. I mean, it seems to be almost impossible, uh, that story. Uh, Barry says, did you see the books of Roy Greenwald? author of Kolbo went to HUC, yes, as we said last class, uh, because uh, his wife said that HUC was very helpful to Rabbi Greenwald. Whenever he needed a book, they would send it over from Cincinnati to Columbus. And when he died, she wanted to repay uh, HUC for being so for good to her husband, always sending him any book he needed, which he couldn't have done his research without it, that she gave the books. Uh, his wife, um, I heard from Marvin Fox's widow, and she she was like alienated from the Orthodox world, maybe because her husband suffered a lot in Rabonus. She, uh, she, it's, I, I, I've been told by rabbis, it's very easy, especially for the children and the spouse of the rabbis to feel negative feelings because sometimes the Balabatim, we know Balabatim, they can be cruel. And the children who grow up, you know, it's very hard, especially for the children to know, uh, you know, that the, the Balabatim, the Balabatim want to hate their, hate their father and want to destroy him and things like that. So uh, my sense from Marvin Fox's widow, what she told me is that the, the Rebbitzin had a lot of negative feelings. So in my mind, I imagine it that her attitude was what, you think I'm gonna give it to any of the other shoals in Columbus? All you rabbis remember at the funeral, Marvin Fox spoke and rabbis outside of Columbus, none of the local rabbis spoke. And there was, uh, my sense is that there was bad blood and uh, she figured uh, this will show them and uh, she gave it to HUC. Uh, Rabbi Kelman points out, listen to the panel discussion, the future of Judaism with uh, Rabbi Dunner, Dr. Lamb, and Yosef Ryman of Lakewood. Uh, That's from a long time ago. From but a long that time was, ago, yes. Um, that was a fascinating panel we had and, uh, you know, with, with term motion relief. Uh, yeah, so listen, there's some great stuff. You got to look over the, the website, you find it. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for that. Yes, you're correct. Uh, Naftali says the Shalvin website does not have all the back issues. Correct. They only started putting them on they, when they started, um, I don't know, about 15 years ago, when, uh, when they were creating the issues in a way with PDFs when they could just put them on. Anything before that, you can either ask Naftali, who I know has a complete run, but, uh, or Otsar Achachma, if you have that, uh, you can get it. I have them, all the issues going back to about uh, 1989. I have all the issues and uh, it's top. It's, it, it's full of- uh, They're, they're on HebrewBooks.org. Oh, I didn't know they're on HebrewBooks.org. Okay, very nice. Uh, <laughs> Naftali says that Yonah Manuel's book was translated to English. Yes, I, I forgot about that. It was translated to English. Uh, you can also read, if you Google it, um, his mother, his father died in Bergen-Belsen, as I recalled, 
and also three of his sisters. His brother survived and he survived. His mother was, they, was put on a train. Um, it's, uh, I forget the details, but there was a number of trains sent east and one of the trains was lost. They don't know what happened to it. It never arrived where it was supposed to go. The people were killed and dumped on the side of, of the road. This was at the, the last days of the war. And his mother was one of the people on one of these trains where, uh, so her son did a whole project because someone actually on the train who survived kept track of all the people who died and were just were thrown off. And they were able to locate, as I recall, where they think she was buried, not an individual grave, but a mass grave. But it, it's some crazy story. And uh, it's, they were like, uh, like other Jews from Holland. They were hiding and then they were caught just like Anne Frank and they were sent to Bergen-Belsen unfortunately had the liberation come just a couple of weeks earlier. I, I showed, I told him about the movie. He hadn't seen it. There's a movie that shows the, the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. And the video is really um, just, uh, you got to see it. Uh, it's, you've probably seen it without knowing it's Bergen-Belsen of the, um, the bulldozers bulldozing dead bodies into this mass grave. That was the, the, the British liberated Bergen-Belsen, and uh, it's, it's a, really, it's a shocking video uh, what they took there. Uh, okay, so maybe we won't go this summer, but uh, I'm an optimist, maybe. But if not, it's not. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be traveling. Like I said, New Jersey yesterday had like 230 cases, 7,000 in America. This thing is under control in America, and uh, we're all, if we're vaccinated, I, and in Europe, they're only about two, three months behind us. Uh, ah, so uh, I get a private message that the reason uh, Professor Breuer's book on German Orthodoxy was in German was because it received a grant from a German university. It was then translated into Hebrew, but the, the notes are really not there. And then it was translated to English. I also have the German volume. The German volume has everything. The English has most of the stuff, not all the notes. The Hebrew has less, actually. Um, Ellie says, Eli, interesting about German Tamil Chachamim. That's where I come from. German, Germany is, uh, has many Tamil Chachamim, which you didn't have that much as Gedol Yisrael, but you had many lay people who were very learned and uh, who went to Shirim. Of course, you had regular people, average people as well. Uh, um, but uh, I have a project of translating German Orthodox material. I've put on I've published about 10 different articles on this. The last one was this um, unknown uh, stuff from Shamshan Shem Rafa Hirsch. Before that, uh, and by Hirsch, the Schiller, famous Schiller speech, with the people in Washington Heights refused to publish. I guess uh, they claimed that it would, uh, they thought it would hurt the feelings of the survivors. I think it's because it's just too much German culture. But my next thing Professor is- Shapiro, uh, Yes. I asked it. Your translation literally came out about two or three months. It was scheduled because I'm on the committee. It was scheduled to be printed in volume nine of the collected writings. Gertrude Herschler had done it. And he, you are right that the members of the family felt that uh, the world wasn't ready for it at that time. But literally, that's why Professor Schatz got the letter from you. The, it was scheduled to be published in volume nine, which came out literally a month or two after you. And I, I, had, I, I read the galleys. Yeah, yeah. And I had heard that um, it was, but the, the question is, is it, is the reason they didn't publish it because uh, what they said, uh, because people would be like uh, hurt in a sense. I have to see the actual letter. I have the letter, which you have also sure. that uh, seeing this, or is it because they just thought it was too over the top after the Holocaust to speak about German culture that way? Clear, clearly, after the Holocaust, it was too over the top. Yeah. And I was at the discussions. It finally came to the fruition where it was decided it was time to print it and publish it. And you came out a, few, a month or two before. I, I, I wish I knew it because I asked about this and I asked people and no one... Well, had, we have, we'll have a private conversation I, at some I, point. I know, because, because would've, it would have saved a lot of effort to, to do that. But I was told that Gertrude Hersher published it. And when I asked the people... You know, it took me a while. It took about a year and a half before it finally appeared. When I asked, there wasn't a plan to publish it. And they told me that uh, we do have a translation. There is a plan to publish it one day. That's what I was told. 
Had they told me that it's coming out in volume nine, I would have let it go. But uh, one day could be 10 years. So uh, I decided let's go ahead with it. And uh, then right after I published it. Uh, I'll it send you out. some emails. I'll yeah. send you some emails. Um, and, uh, but the next thing is no one has it because it's a unicum, something that Israel Hildesheimer wrote about the need to educate women, Torah study. And uh, that I'm going to, I'm translating now. And I also have another thing. So, um, and I'm, you know, you're probably much better than I am in German translation, but uh, I have someone look it over. Uh, uh, Barry says, this Rabbi Joseph Duner of Amsterdam was the great, great nephew was Professor Joseph Duner, chair of political science at YU. I did not know that. Uh, he was a great scholar, Dr. Manny Rackman, who met him during World War II, brought him to YU. I did not know that. The uh, Rabbi Duner, Penny Duner's great, great grandfather is the brother of this Rabbi Duner of Amsterdam. And uh, there's a whole Duner family in England. Um, maybe he comes from England. I don't know. Uh, Simcha Manuel Naftali says also one of the leading scholars of the Gonic period. Uh, yeah, I, I would say mostly uh, Ashkenazic uh, Rishonim. Uh, we have another, if you think the scholars of the Gonic period, I don't know if Rabbi, Hart, Rabbi um, um, Kelman may be asking me to talk, is Baruch Brody one of these geniuses. He's a PhD in math, and then he gets another PhD. He wrote the classic book on, um, on the Gaonim. Uh, this, Barry says, this is Rabbi Shimon Schwab asked a shy lover, Baruch Bear, regarding secular education. He told him, can only study secular studies when there's day, no day and night. That pushed, I believe, Rabbi to alter the philosophy. Yes, he, he sent it out to a number of people. The Gera Rebbe, incidentally, said that I can't, I will not answer this question because Rabbi, Her, Rabbi Hirsch, we do not say anything negative. But uh, the Rugged Shavar responded, Rabarach Bear, Rabarach Bear. That answer is where you get the beginnings of this idea, which is false, that it was only Harasha, it was an emergency measure. Rabarach Bear, who never read Hirsch, he says, well, it must have only been an emergency measure to him, Derek Heretz, in order to keep people in the fold, which is completely incorrect. But um, that's where Baruch Bear says, and then it becomes then a myth in the yeshiva world. I did find another way, Rabbi Klein from Zev Klein, who was in Argentina after the war, he responded, and Rabbi Bloch. All these responses are in Leo Levy's volume. Uh, and later, Rabbi Schwab writes an article. Um, he writes a little, not more than an article, these and those in which, and he, he reflected on this later, that, uh, you know, this was a youthful thing. Um, Mark Hurwitz of Columbia, no. Um, Someone privately asked me in the picture of Rabbi Greenwald, it seems his wife's head is, hair is not covered. You find me a rabbi's wife in the 40s in America whose hair was covered in the early 50s. Uh, it's almost impossible. And uh, other than the, 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 the German Frankfurt people that would, but uh, it, you're right, it's not covered. But I can show you pictures of people much greater than Rabbi Greenwald. Yes, Rabbi, in fact, the essay of, Rabbi uh, Schwab, in his one of his volumes, publishes in English sections of this book that he wrote, the book uh, that he wrote in the 30s, in Hankers, I think it was called, in which uh, you, you see his rejection of the term Derek Heretz philosophy, but then he also wrote about these and those. That's the name of the book he wrote later, the little contrast, I should say. And the, it, it's using the Talmudic phraseology, arguing that both these and those are valid ways. The German Orthodox way is valid and the, um, the yeshiva way is valid. Rabbi Schwab also published in Hamayan, an anonymous, under anonymously published this, a letter defending the term Derech Heretz approach. And in response to Rabbi Dessler, Rabbi Dessler argues that uh, the yeshiva world's philosophy is that we are not concerned with the masses. We're just trying to create Gadoli Torah. So if we lose a thousand to, you know, for every one Jew that becomes a God will we lose a thousand, it's worth it. Because we don't create schools where we teach them, you know, uh, secular studies to keep them in the fold. If they want to become a merchant or something like that, we'll help them. But we're not going to create a school, like a high school or anything like that to keep them in the fold. And Rabbi Schwab's response was, it was almost a response of outrage. How can we just abandon all these Jews and say that we don't care? These are people who will not send their kids to a school unless they're given the basic skills that they can get a white collar job. And that's what we did in Germany. And um, Rabbi Dessler's approach is quite shocking. It's not the typical Lithuanian approach, which had the Alvna system, as I mentioned. So Rabbi Schwab, he didn't want to publish under his own name, but he did publish that and uh, he wrote it. And now everyone knows he wrote it. And this is a defense 
of the, the German Orthodox approach, but recognizing there's room for others. Professor Breuer, who we've been speaking about, he publishes an article in Hamayan in the 60s in which he explains why we, that is German Orthodox Jews, and he's writing this as the son of Isaac Breuer, who's the theoretician of the Gudis Yisrael. His grandfather, Shlomo Breuer, is the founder, or one of the founders of the Gudis Yisrael. The Gudis Yisrael is founded in Germany. Um, and, he, and Professor Boyer explains why we can no longer support a good Israel, because he says in Marienbad, you had the Godoyim from the East and you had the German Orthodox. At all the conferences of the good Israel, the German Orthodox approach and the German Orthodox rabbis were given a place at the dais and their approach was recognized as legitimate, not the only approach, of course, but as a legitimate approach. He says, but now in the land of Israel, 1960s, our lifestyle, the German Orthodox lifestyle, which you founded in places like the Chorov School and others, is not recognized by the Agudas Yisrael as a legitimate approach to life. The only approach they recognize as legitimate is the yeshivish approach. And therefore, we are not leaving Agudas Yisrael. You have told us that we no longer have a place in Agudas Yisrael. And so that's a, an article that's of great significance in knowing how Agudas Yisrael you know, no longer had a place at the table anymore for uh, the German Orthodox. Barry says, Rabbi Aaron Lichlessin wrote, when he made Aliyah, he asked the Rav, to whom he shared Shilas, and the Rav told him, Rav Zalman Arbach. And Rav Aaron wrote a moving tribute to Rav Arbach. Yes, indeed. Rabbi, I heard from Yonah Emanuel that of all the Hespedim and all the articles about Rav Zalman Arbach, the one by Rav Lichlessin is the best. And Rav Lichlessin was not a Talmud but he was someone who became close to Rav Shlomo Zalman In the earlier classes, we spoke a bit about this. I even read you portions, as I recall, from the Hesmaid. And he would go to ask them questions. Why the Rav thought that? I don't know what type of relationship the Rav had, if they corresponded at all. Uh, why he would have thought that, but uh, that's what he told them. Um, someone privately says that Rabbi Whitey Horowitz asked him questions for BMT when I was there, yes. Uh, you know, I was also on BMT and I didn't know that. Uh, uh, Thank you, Naftali. Um, Eli, I knew Rav Shog quite well, and he took the Berea community quite far to the right, saying in some ways the school quality suffered. Well, that's a different issue. I'll leave it to the, we have people right now listening from the German Orthodox community. I also have George Frankel's uh, little booklet about that. That's a, that's a dispute, of course, in the German Orthodox in the Washington Heights world. There are people who thought that uh, it was a mistake and how much, and then uh, in 2008, you know, with the declaration, by the rabbi of the community that really termed Erech Eretz, it doesn't exist anymore because the culture is so debased. I uh, went to that school. I went to that school, believe me. It was a fantastic education. Yeah. So, but the, 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 there's a whole debate. I don't want to weigh into it, especially when we have people who grew up and who were part of that community of what, but I did, I can tell you that in my article on um, attitudes to Hirsch, I wrote an article, Attitudes Towards Hirsch Among the the Lithuanian Rabbanim and also the Rav Cook's school, I did mention the, the controversy that broke out on the, uh, the 200th anniversary of the birth of Hirsch when the rabbi of the community announced that basically termed Erech Eretz, so we can't relate to it anymore because it's a decadent culture and the response from the, the certain machers there. At the end of the day, look, Weimar Germany was also quite decadent. So uh, it's not like in, in Germany, it was always a high culture. Uh, Ellie says, I think you know there's a renewed Hildesheimer Seminary. My son-in-law was one of their first graduates. Not only, yes, I know that there's a renewed seminary. In fact, I was asked to speak at the seminary. Let me say something about the seminary, though. While we ate there on our trip to Germany, we had lunch there at this seminary. And it's a wonderful, wonderful place, supported by Louder. But what I said to them was, I said, what does this have to do with uh, Israel Hildesheimer Seminary? There's no Torim Derech Eretz here. It's, it's just the name. They took the name, but it has nothing to do with, they claim to be the historical continuation. And if they were recognized, they, there was a court case and the German government did not recognize this, they would get a lot of money. But they did take the name and on the website, they had pictures of the different rabbis, but there's no connection to it anymore. That is, it's not the ideology. So what I was told by the, the head of it is that, well, today we don't need that. We need something different. We're trying to reach the Russian Jews. So that's the focus. So that's fine. Before COVID, I, dis I discovered where Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg lived, and I paid for, I showed this to you in the previous class, the Schulperstein of Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, at least I think I showed it to you, the, the gold thing they put on the ground, 
And there was supposed to be a big ceremony in uh, June of uh, 2020. And the Rabbinical Seminary of Berlin, the Adas Yisrael community, was supposed to be there. And they were supposed to speak. And I was supposed to speak. And COVID uh, destroyed everything. So I was going to do this jointly because they looked to Rabbi Weinberg as the last um, Rosh Hashiva. But I have to be honest and say there's no, there's, there's no connection. There's no connection other than the fact that Mayor Hildesheimer from Israel comes and lectures there, but it doesn't, it's not a Torah and Derech Eretz approach. Uh, it's like a, it's an approach, they're teaching the rabbis, they have to minister for people, uh, you know, the Russian immigrants and things like that. But that's very interesting. Your son-in-law is one of their first graduates. Uh, the, the Chazan of Prague, who those who've been to Central Europe will remember him, he's also studying for Smicha there. He, he's in Berlin during the week and he comes home to Prague. Uh, uh, Rabbi Pollock spoke about that train. Okay, I didn't know about that. He also wrote a memoir. I have to look at it. We're thinking about Joseph Pollock, or Joseph Pollock, who spoke for Torah in Motion. Who, uh, I, I know. Yeah. Right, Rabbi Pollock, Rabbi Pollock spoke uh, for Racing Yama Shoah, and he talked about the three trains and then the lost train. His family's on the lost train with other Dutch Jews, and the train wound up either at or near Leipzig. And that's when people got off it. And the people of the town actually ministered to people who were on the train. I think Rabbi Pollock's father passed away and his mother was, was cared for. And then they made their way back. But well, why is it true? It's, it's, it's not lost then if it made it to Leipzig. Oh, well, right. So, but, but it was known as the lost train. Oh, okay. Rabbi Pollock think, yeah. emphasized that it wasn't lost. Okay. It actually wound up somewhere. Well, many of the people on this train, they were lost. So maybe that's why they call it the lost that's, train. Right, right. But the train did wind up somewhere, wow. actually. Interesting. I have to look it at was, it. It, yeah. it was the Russians who actually assisted people from, from the train. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting story. Uh, I only, just earlier today, I briefly glanced at it. I didn't get the whole story because I was looking for something else. And lo and behold, it popped up. There's a link, I believe, also on the, uh, yeah, on the, in the Wikipedia page of Yona Manuel, you can get the link. And now I'm going to look at it after you say that. Um, and finally, last comment here. Someone remarked to Rav Schwab, how come the Hershey School and the Bro Yeshiva in the Heights has not produced Godoli? Or Rav Schwab said they may be... That may be true at this time, but we also do not have Balabatim sitting in jail. Okay, that's Rabbi um, Rev Breuer also had nice uh, comments. Uh, like he said once, uh, I'd rather have Glot Yashar than Glot Kosher. When the Glot Kosher craze began, Glot Yashar means be honest in business. And the famous one of Rabbi Breuer, I've mentioned it before, but we have some new people that when the separate seating at weddings started coming in, Rabbi Brewer said, okay, we can do the separate seating at wedding, but not for the unmarried people. They have to sit together to make new uh, um, The Hersheyan approach was focused on Barabatim. It was focused on lay people. If you were a, a, a top student and if you had potential, then you could go to Eastern Europe to one of the great yeshivas and you could become a great Tamil Chacham and come back and you could be a Dayan. However, communities are not made up of Gedol Yisrael. You have post scheme Gedol Yisrael, they're the leaders. Communities are made up of learned, pious people. They're the backbone of the community. And that's what Hirsch said we have to build. In Eastern Europe, You'd have a whole town, and maybe out of the whole town of 100 kids, one of them will go to the yeshiva. And the rest of them, their, their Jewish education ended at age 12 when they went to be an apprentice and then worked. And the rest of their life, they were basically ignorant Jewishly. They had plenty of Jewish feeling. These were good Jews, but they didn't have any education. Germany, and, but this, you could live that way in Eastern Europe. This was, uh, you know, people didn't go to college. Wait a minute. Live in the city. Uh, uh, hold, on, so, so, hold on, let me just finish. So this was Eastern Europe. Germany, you're living in a Western society, a modern society. You can't keep the Balabatim ignorant. You can't keep them uh, with high school, or, you know, the equivalent of a secular education, the beginning of high school. And you certainly can't keep them with a Jewish education, the, uh, high, uh, you know, uh, an eighth grade Jewish education, because they're going to go off to the university and they're going to leave Judaism. Hirsch's approach, so you say he didn't produce Godoli, he was not, his point was not to produce Godoli. He no, was going to make the community, issue, no? There were maybe 10, 10 Jew, 10 from families when he came there. And there were over a thousand when he- No, no, but hold on, hold on, hold on. The, but my point is in response to not producing Godoli, that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to create pious communities. And from those pious communities, you have great Talmud Echachami. As for the community, you say, Ali, yes, you had a small community that brought him in, but people forget that there was another community 
an Orthodox community. So the, the, the idea that there was only a few Shomer Shabbos, it's not true. But it's, these it's, were the people who were who didn't want to be part of the main community. In the main community, you also had uh, religious Shomer Shabbos people. But from Hirsch's perspective, these people were on the down, were on the way down because they didn't recognize that you need to separate. But certainly they were a minority. However, the criticism of the German Orthodox is they didn't produce Godolin. The last Godolin they produced was, uh, that it's not true. They produced, uh, they, they didn't produce maybe like uh, the big ones you have in Eastern Europe, but they had, uh, they weren't opposed to doing that. It just was in their communities, they needed rabbis with secular educations and they needed, and uh, you had the people who came out of that who were great, great Talmud Yechachamim, but- uh, Yeah, and, but it's not, uh, you, need, you need everything, you need everything. And that wasn't their model. If you're gonna have produce, if you're gonna go for this, that you're gonna try to take every kid who can achieve and turn him into a gadol and you get one out of a hundred and the rest, whatever, that that wasn't their approach. Um, did they produce great Torah scholars? Yes, they produced great Torah scholars. Did they produce the level of the people in Eastern Europe? Uh, okay, perhaps not. Uh, but uh, that, that wasn't, you don't need to be, uh, to, to achieve great things. You don't need to, uh, perhaps everyone doesn't need to strive for that. And, uh, and you could always bring them in from Eastern Europe. In Frankfurt, you had great Rabbanim brought in from, uh, in the general community and others. So, uh, Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, do we care that he, was, uh, he wasn't trained in Germany? He became a Torah and Derech Eretz Jew, Rav Avram Eliel Kaplan. There's nothing wrong with bringing in a Jew from Eastern Europe to come become a rabbi, just like there's nothing wrong with bringing a German rabbi in. When they wanted to know how to run Beis Yaakov, they brought the German educators. So uh, we will leave that. Oh, there are two. Oh, this will be the last thing. There are two Mordechai Breuer's. Right, I forgot. They only, I said there are two. I only gave you the one. The other Mordechai Breuer is, he's the Bible scholar. The one who created the whole, as you said, Shitat Pachino, to created this whole school of thought. And I'll, I'll end now with a funny story. There, uh, and I'll, this will be the last thing I say because it's already late. I was, we had a conference in 2010, I think it was, in memory of Professor Mordechai Breuer, the scholar who taught at Bar Elan and wrote about German Orthodoxy. And I, that's where I gave my talk, which was then published. You can see it in the Daniel Sperber Jubilee volume because they didn't publish a volume from this in which it's, uh, I see the Sefer Yovel, for that's for the rabbi Mordechai Breuer, who taught, by the way, with uh, Rav Shach even in Yeshiva Hadarom. So we had a conference de devoted, de dedicated in memory of Professor Breuer, and it was focused on the yeshivas and German orthodoxy. As is the case with all these sorts of conferences at universities, you have the president who comes the first day and gives the opening comments, welcoming everyone to this great conference. So the president, who shall remain nameless, but he was a physicist, as I recall. He wasn't in the humanities. He comes, and of course, these presidents always have assistants who write up the speeches. So he proceeds in front of a room of 150 people, 200 people, including the entire family of Professor Breuer, his children, his nephews and nieces. He gives a whole talk about the greatness of Rabbi Breuer and what he did in Tanakh. And after about a minute, we realize what he's talking about. I mean, people put their heads down there. And he goes on for five or six minutes about the greatness. He should have known that Rabbi Breuer never taught at Bar Elan, but he's speaking about how we're all here for the conference and we're all sitting there and no one says a word, all about Rabbi Breuer. He walks out and does this thing. And then, of course, the, the, the guy who's, who's in charge, Professor Spitzer, he says something like, okay, well, that was interesting. <laughs> Let's get on to the conference for Professor Breuer. But uh, what can you do? You got to blame the assistant uh, for that one. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, I know all about Rabbi Wolbe. Um, he learned in, Rabbi Wolbe learned in the rabbinical seminary of Berlin. I don't know if he learned in Frankfurt. He learned in Berlin, and then he went to the Mir. He definitely learned in the rabbinical seminary of Berlin. Is it Frankfurt as well? Maybe, I don't know. Okay, Rabbi Kelman. Thank you. I was going to talk about Schneer Lyman's article in tradition, but we'll have to leave that for another time. Where he wrote about this, the letter of Rabbi Schwab, you know, against Ra, uh, Rab, Rabbi, Rabbi Dester. But uh, I'm sure you know about that article. I forgot many years ago in tradition. Anyway, okay. 
Thank you, everybody. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're starting Rachel Sharansky Danziger, starting a, a series of storytelling in the rise of kings. We'll go to ancient, uh, like Jewish history, from modern Jewish history to ancient Jewish history, uh, the period of Tanakh, of course, Navim Rishonim. So that everybody's invited to 11 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning, Simi Peters, Wednesday afternoon, we leave. One, Wednesday morning, Marty Lection will give his class at 11, then at 1 p.m., um, Simi Peters will be starting Sefer Year Miyahu. I'll do an um, advanced, you know, a 12 part series on Sefer Year Miyahu. And Thursday morning at 11, Truly Mishnah will begin a six part series on touring the land of Israel. And um, okay, we look forward to learning with you. Uh, this week's Parsha Shear will be given by Noah Chezis in uh, outside of Boston. And um, and Perk Avich here Friday morning. So we look forward to learning with you. Invite your friends. Yes, to everybody saying we got extra on a holiday weekend. We paid time and a half. So we had a time and a half shear for uh, this evening and uh, lots of always interesting comments and interesting shear. And uh, it's great to see all the uh, back and forth and the give and take. And um, okay. And I assume, Mark, this is the is the Brody you're talking about, right? The book on the, the, the Goni. Right. This yes, is the one? Robert Brody. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Naftali, see what I just sent you. It, it just mentions uh, Frankfurt. I mean Berlin. Okay, everyone. Good night. Lila Tov, everybody. Be well. Bye. Bye.